Hi, pottery peeps. It's evening here in Utah, so hopefully won't have any problems with lighting. Um, I didn't know if I was going to make this video, but um, after talking with the person that this video is about, um, I decided to go ahead and, and film it. If you've been a potter long enough, you will be asked to make an urn. Uh, it's a highly emotional thing to do to make an urn for somebody. When I make an urn, um, I uh, ask something about the person that I'm making it for. And I don't care, you know, religion, we're not going to get into that in beliefs. Um, as a potter, I'm pretty much uh, an earth child. <laughs> um, but I usually make two or three variations of what they're asking for. And every single time they come to pick their urn, it's, they say, how did you know? This is exactly what they would have wanted. And it's almost like I'm not the one making the urn, that there's some other forces out there, some higher being, some greater good out there that is instructing me um, how this urn needs to be made. And, um, but this time I'm making an urn for someone who is still living, um, who is dying. And, uh, it's a, com a completely different experience. Um, so she contacted me. She saw me at the art festival, um, in, in September and she fell in love with this piece and, um, talking with her, um, the type of urn that I'm going to make for her is the kind of urn I would make for myself. Um, she wants the tree of life. She wants something similar to this. Now, when you make an urn, there's a lot of things that go into making an urn. Um, depending on the size of the person, you need to make something that's going to hold four to seven cubic, um, or cubic inches, or four to seven cups, okay? So when you're making something and you're thinking of along those lines, I mean, it's incredibly humbling um, to be asked to make final resting spot for somebody. And it's, it's, I'm very, very honored, but it is highly emotional. So we're talking with her and uh, because I told her, I said that, that something like this is not going to work for a nerd. For one thing, there's not enough volume to hold um, the material of a cremated body. Um, this is hollow on the inside. Um, it's actually a flower vase. And the tree itself is also hollow, and I sculpted the tree. But, so what I'm going to do so that she can have this tree of life, um, we're going to put a base on it and have it open so that there is more um, area for, for ashes to fit. And I'm also going to put a top on it. So I'm going to take you along and show you how to make a version of this. Okay, so I'm actually going to throw two of these donuts. They're also called a turret. And I'll give you some history on those. It's actually kind of cool because I'm one of those pottery geeks that love all pottery history. I have four and a half pounds here. This is B-Mix by Laguna. Um... So, I'm also in my hydro bat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slap center. So anything that's anything over two pounds is actually a good idea to slap center, or definitely five pounds and up, four and a half pounds. So slap center it, and then I'm going to go ahead and center it. Let's see if I can get my wheel going likes to be kick-started <laughs> and that's the one thing I can't do right now I really need to get someone who can bend down on their knees and tighten up my foot pedal there we go we're getting it so we'll go ahead and center this now these donuts or turrets have been around forever it basically is the original canteen so they have 
a history, you know, people would um, fill them with basically wine or mead since they didn't drink a lot of water back in the day because they didn't know how to purify it. So we're talking medieval times. And then they could tie it to um, their horse and uh, have something to drink. And then, as cultures go, in Mexico or Latin America, they would make really big ones out of terracotta. And they would uh, fire them, soak them in water, put them in front of windows, and let the air blow through them, and that was a, um, their version of a swamp cooler. And then in the south, workers in the fields back um, 1800s or so forth, um, they would fill them up with water and anchor them with a stick in uh, riverbeds to keep their water, or what they were drinking, cold. So there's even more history with these guys. It's really fascinating, actually, that these shapes have been around for so long, and every culture across the world has one. And it's not like they picked up the cell phone and talked to each other or got on Pinterest or Instagram to find ins inspiration. So potters, and they have found that potters developed different shapes and so forth like this all about the same time, even though they weren't in any contact. Anyway, there's your pottery history lesson. So what I'm doing is I'm supporting on the, this side with my hand here, trying to keep it centered as I make like a hockey puck, a big hockey puck. Because I need to get this, my bat is actually rocking. I need to get one of those chamois things that some potters are doing so that my bats don't do that because the holes in the the bat, or they get worn. I got rubber grommets. And I use these bats a lot. These donuts, or turrets, are actually one of my favorite things to throw. They're just fun. They're different, they're challenging. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, is I'm gonna open this straight to the bat. Okay. up some water. Then I'm going to pull that out, and as I'm pulling it out, I'm kind of flattening it too. And this is not easy to do. <laughs> Take some straight there. I don't want to lose that clay, because I'm not sure if four pounds of clay, four and a half pounds of clay is going to be enough. I'm not sure. So I'm going to make more than one, just to make sure that A little wetter. I don't want to. I'm gonna pull that out, but I don't want to pull it off on center either. Because you get these off center, they're even harder to do. <laughs> All right. I need to. I've got a bunch of clay that's stuck to these this bat, but you kind of need to leave that there. Um, otherwise, you need something to help anchor. So I kind of got a little skim of something, skim of clay to help me anchor. So what I'm going to do now, actually get my sponge with me, is I'm going to split this, okay? Sorry about the knocking, I didn't realize this bat not so much. You don't realize noises when you're working in the studio until you start filming them. So I'm just going to keep pushing that down. And I do want to um, leave a little bit of clay there because I will be trimming this. We do, in order to get their shape, we do need to, I need to trim, need to trim that shape. All right. So now I'm going to pull up this inner wall. Actually, I need more speed. Normally, I would just go ahead and kick get the speed I want. Let's see if I can get some more speed here. OK. 
Okay, I want my walls, it's very important for something like this that the walls are consistent in thickness. I'm going to pull this up. I'm a little off there at the top. I'm not really worried about that because these guys are going to get joined. I'm going to start shaping my donut. So I've given that kind of a nuclear reactor <laughs> type shape. Now I'm going to pull this wall up. This clay is actually pretty stiff. my kick wheel. I absolutely love it because I can control the speed so much and I don't even usually have to think about it but when your knees don't work it's a whole other thing. And I have a fused ankle so I can't use one of my scut wheels over there with the foot feed. I'm just falling apart. I have played and worked hard pretty much all my life. Okay so I've got a lot of clay down there. I want to try and get that up. Because if I don't get it up, then I'm just trimming it. And if you watch the chip and dip bolts, I try not to. Um, I try to have everything coming off the wheel as clean as possible. So it reduces the amount of trimming. And it, by doing that, not only do you re reduce your time on making something, which in turn reduces the cost of what you charge for something, but it also reduces the need for so much reclaim. You know, if you trim a lot and you have a lot of reclaim, that's a lot of work too. I'd rather throw pots. I don't want to spend my time doing that any more than I have to. All right, so I'm just, I'm gonna push that in. Still have a lot of clay down there. I want to get up. All right. This woman that I met, um, cancer's daughter, and uh, it's you know how sometimes you meet somebody and. It's almost like your soul recognizes. It's like, where have you been? You know, I've been waiting all these years for you to show up. Um, the type of person that you get together and just the last couple of days talking with her about this urn and what she wanted. No lull in the conversation. You have so much in common. And it's just kismet, you know? It's just magic. And it just breaks my heart that she's been given the diagnosis that she's been given. And she's the age of my baby brother, so she's younger than I am. We were born the same year. It's just not fair, you know? Okay, so what you want to do when you're making these, you see how I pulled that out. I want to make sure I'm not trapping any water. And since I'm throwing this, I want to get that slip off of there too. If I have too much slip, I mean this clay is fairly wet now. If I have too much slip, they're just going to slide on each other. So I want them to stick. I want them to kiss. going here. So I'm just going to collar this outside in just a touch. 
just make it just a little easier to join these guys. And then I'm going to pull them together. Make sure you've got enough water so that your hands are sliding. This is the last time when you're doing something fiddly like this, you don't want your clay to grab on your hands. I just need them to kiss. And of course, my wheel's slowing down. <laughs> Patience! Patience. Actually, I see where it's starting to fall right there. I don't want it doing that. So I'll reach in there. There we go. That's a better. And then we'll go ahead and... there. Just hold your hands steady while they decide if they like each other or not. If you have an electric wheel, you won't have to worry about trying to kick it, keep the speed going. I just got that last little bit there. playing nice with you here. I do have more clay ready. And this is the new bee mix from Laguna that everybody's complaining about and I've never thrown with it. I usually do the bee mix with aardvark but I ran out and I need to get this done and my clay supplier is closed for the holiday. And uh, so if this doesn't work with the Laguna so I'll be, do, I'll be doing it again with the aardvark. Because I haven't had, um, a lot of potters have been complaining about the new bee mix, and I haven't had the problems that they've had. It's a little softer. doesn't like to be worked with as long, but I haven't had near the problem. But that gave me a little bit more fits than normal. Okay, so now what you want to do, now that you, you want to make sure that they stay joined, so you take your metal rib, you go over that joint, and you trap that air. As soon as you've got that joint really good, you trap the air, and so you're, you've got the air supporting, supporting this, and it makes it easier to shape it. So now that's all about shaping. And then um, I will show you when I trim this tomorrow how to trim them. Basically, it's the same thing I'm doing now. I'm just making sure that the shape on one side matches the shape on the other. I do need to, this is going to be a composite piece because looking at this donut, it's going to shrink 12% and probably will only hold um, three cups. So I need to have it hold at least five. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna grab all this clay. This is what I'm talking about with wet trimming. I want to make it as easy as possible for me to trim this tomorrow. So I'm going to go ahead and trim away all that clay that sits down there at the bottom in that little corner. Plus, this is one of those hydrobats, and so 
this donut will not have to be wired off. It'll pop off. And I have found with the Hydra bats, if you leave that little skim of clay, it takes longer for them to pop off. And sometimes they don't pop off pretty. So we definitely want it to pop off pretty. So now let's get this clay that's been sitting here in this middle, anchoring this guy. And if you're wondering why potters usually, if you're new to the game, you have your slot bucket with all your slip. But then the clay that you trim off, most potters will either have another bucket by their wheel or they make a little pile on their wheel. And the reason that they do that is, well, the reason I do it, can't really speak for the others, but I'm pretty sure they're doing the same thing I am. Um, I'll put that on a plaster bat, wedge it up and use it the next day. Um, it doesn't go in the reclaim. That's really good clay there. Why do I want to put it in reclaim? And I have to go through the work of drying it out and wedging it up. Luckily I have a pug mill now, but I just got the pug mill last year, so. I have wedged thousands of pounds of reclaim, probably tens over the years. All right, so now we're gonna let that firm up. And if you're going to let it firm up to let it hard, you do want to poke a hole in it. I will probably poke a hole in it um, later. So my bat is probably 14 inches. So not sure. Well, might be okay because it's actually fairly tall. So I am going to throw another because anytime I do something like this, I throw back up. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I need to throw the base, or I'm going to get clay all over this. I'm going to set this on a base, and so I'm going to throw the base, and I'm going to throw the top and the lid. And to do that, I'm actually going to work off the hump. Um, I don't know how much clay I've got here, but we'll go ahead and start with the top. I'm not exactly sure how much clay. I'll need. And when I do stuff like this, I definitely throw more than one. So I'm basically making a, um, a neck to a base or something, you know? I'm just making, I just need to go up. I also want to make sure that I am, with the donuts that I threw, that I am keeping the thickness of the clay about the same. I'll get that some more down there, but I can't get my hand, my hand down there. And I will be adding some decorative elements to this. So, when I do things like that, I, I leave my clay just a little thicker. So since I'm, I don't have to worry about the bottom because it needs to be open. But I'm going to go ahead and create a foot. I don't know if I have a wire with me. So that's where I'm going to end up cutting it, is right there. So this is going to be the piece I'm going to be working with. So I'm going to actually color this in just a touch. Now that looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and rip this off, get the slurry off of it. And since I am going to add a lid, I'm going, whoops, don't do that <laughs> when you've got your um, metal rib in your hand and you're doing small bits or small pieces, be be careful of that. So I'm just going to take that off. <laughs> I 
I want to round this off. Anytime that you take something off with a needle tool, spend some time to round it off because that needle tool makes a sharp edge. What I was trying to do is I wanted to, I'm going to do a lid with a flange. So lids for urns, you don't want a knob on them um, for obvious reasons. I mean, they're not meant to be opened. Um, a lot of people will seal them. So I'm just creating a resting spot here for the lid to sit in. Okay. So I use that metal rib to give myself like a 45. So I'll have a larger flange like you would do for a teapot to sit in, to sit in there. So this is going to be my joint here with the donut. But one thing I want to try and do, her and I have, we got to be related because um, her ancestry and my ancestry, Celtic and Scottish and um, all of that in there. So we are definitely going to give this urn some Celtic knots, some Celtic braids. This is an MKM tool. When you do this when it's wet like this, get that tool wet. So I'm actually going to going to support from the inside. Nice thing about a kick wheel, so I can move that, move this wheel at the speed I want it for something like this. So for, I didn't actually, if you don't get a good impression the first time, take it out. Probably have my bifocals on because I can't really see what I'm doing. As soon as the sun goes down, man. It's like I can't see nothing. All right. So, knock the water off of that. Make sure I'm going to put my finger in there further rather than just the tip of my finger. Have it run right along the whole length of my finger. You risk pushing this out more than you want doing this. Okay, that's better. But since it's still on the wheel, can't touch the outside anymore, but I can touch the inside and I can put that back on center. And I can touch it here. here. I think slurry up there. I'm gonna get a line there from the tool. It must have hit hit it. You can get comfortable decorating on the wheel before you take your piece off. You will save yourself a lot of time. I'm also going to take this and I'm going to give it some definition. I want places for the glaze to break. And I want to frame in that design. This will give the family two different places to put like a brass plaque with the name, dates, that kind of thing. So they can put, that's another thing you need to think of doing an urn, all of these different things that go into it that doesn't go into a normal piece. And unfortunately with COVID and all the crazy stuff that's happening in our world, and we're making too many urns. Oh, 
I always tend to slow down when I do stuff like this, you know? I mean, don't rush through them. There's a reverence to it. And I tend to, since I, um, normally, one of the reasons why I ask so many questions on who um, the person is, so I can kind of get to know them so that when I'm actually throwing the piece, I'm thinking of them. And I really do think that that is one of the reasons why they, um, everybody that I've sold one to is extremely happy with them. So I'm actually going to grab a bat to set this on. I've dried my hands off. I'm going to just lift that off. Set that over there. Okay, so now I am going to do the base. So just recentering that. Open it up. I am going to leave this uh, bottom. I want to give plenty of weight because this donut is not going to be, the center of gravity <laughs> is going to be a little different. This is another, reason, another way that function comes into when you're making composite pieces. You need to think of those things. So, and something like this, I don't want it to tip over. And since it's going to be tall, it's going to have the turret, the circle, the donut sticking out. This base has to not only add me, add some more volume, it also needs to act at a, as a weight to keep this paper, you know, to keep it down and not getting knocked over. So I'm going to mimic what I just did, I'm just going to do it bigger. And I am leaving this base. Um, this base is actually going to be, the walls are going to be thicker too. I don't want thin walls. It's going to have to support a lot of weight. And when I put this together, it's going to have to um, be more leather hard than I normally put things together since it does have to support a lot of weight. So I'm going to go ahead and get my throwing lines off of there. Need to, so I'm going to take this tool again. Get this clay off of here. I will not be trimming this either because I want that clay there. So I need to add my foot. I actually might fold that over. I don't want a wider foot. And I will, like I threw another donut, I will throw two more of these pieces. Just so that when I'm putting them, to, them together, if anything goes wrong, I have a spare. So I'm gonna go ahead and push this in a little bit. Actually narrow. I want to give this a waist. I'm making sure, even though my walls are thicker, I'm making sure that they're consistently the same.
Take my drawing lines out again. with that. I am going to go ahead and um, actually I'm not I'm not going to decorate this one just yet. Um, for one thing I can't get that tool down here at the bottom. But since I do have it on the wheel I am going to add in these lines. So that I have a place to put the braid. I might go ahead and add the braid here though. I'll have to get it up on a banding wheel to add the braid down at the bottom. And this will end up being smushed into an oval. Okay, so I basically have stopped my wheel. I really need my glasses. But, you know, the nice thing about adding in the decoration here, if I totally mess it up, I'll just take it out and do it again. This seriously would be an urn I would make for myself. It's just amazing how much her and I, her name is Wendy, her and I have in common. I just have really enjoyed talking with her, getting to know her, getting to hear her crazy family stories that are just as crazy as mine. <laughs> All right, so that's it for this, and then um, I will pick you back up when um, I put it all together, okay? All right, so I completely forgot I gotta make a lid. <laughs> so I went ahead and centered some more clay. I've got calipers here, and so I am going to, so I'm gonna stop this wheel so nothing goes flying. So I'm going to measure the inside of this lid so that I know what size to make the lid or right inside of the, the neck of that so that I know I'm already there. So what I'm gonna do is this lid's gonna be made upside down and I want a fairly long flange, probably an inch. Um, and I will actually make this flange so that if they want to add some sort of a seal, they can do that. So it's a good idea to keep double checking your measurements as you're doing this. I actually, it's harder for me to, to do, I kinda want a bulbous lid. I learned how to do stuff with a ruler, <laughs> and uh, all right, and um, I kind of want this to sit in there, so I'm just kind of looking at it since it's sitting right in front of me as I throw this. I'm going to take a little bit of this off. And I've thrown it thick enough that I can trim it to fit if I need to, okay? But I will double check it. And we are um, going to, I need to leave some clay here. Like I said, there's not going to be a knob on this. But we're going to put a, I'm going to put a triquatra, healthy triquatra. 
in it for her. So I'm just going to take this. I gave myself more clay than I needed. Dry my hands off. Pick this up. Set it there with that. And then that will dry out too. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and throw the extra pieces that I'm going to need for the other donut um, and my spare pieces in case I need them. Okay? We will see you tomorrow when these are dried out enough. Okay, my um, donuts are ready to trim, but the sun is coming in here like crazy, so I don't even know if I'm going to be able to show this, but I'm going to attempt to, and we'll see how far we get. I'm actually setting you in front of the window, but I don't know if this stand will hold you up. I'm going to use some bats here. Make do with what we got, right? Let's see if we can support it. So it doesn't fall. And I know the sun is coming in like crazy, so I apologize for that. But with these um, Hydra Bats, um, they literally just pop off. And I turn them over center it right back where I took it off. And I'm just gonna trim this and this and um, make it more like a donut. So, let's give this a try. So there's not a lot of trimming because I did knees really stiff, probably because there's snow coming in, so. But this wheel likes to be jump-started, so. I'm just going to trim all that weight that's on the size that I couldn't get when I was wet trimming. Probably give it a little bit more. There we go. A little bit more in the center. And then I'm going to trim this inside. So I'm going to get the bulk of all of that off. I don't trim very much here at the bottom because that's, dang it, gotta cut those nails. Um, that's where um, it's the thinnest. I basically want these edges to come up and just make that continuous curve so it looks like the other side. That's what I'm after. So I'll just trim until I'm happy with that. And this is what I mean by wet trimming. Do all, try to do as much wet trimming as you can. It saves you so much time. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. And then I will bring in my metal rib. smooth all my lines out and just really finish it off. Just really make it look nice. And just continue that curve all the way around so that it's pretty much the same on both sides, you know. There'll be variations, but pretty much. So any other lines I can't get off? I can, whoops, don't do that. <laughs> Woo. So don't push too hard if you're not anchored. <laughs> and then I just wanna make sure that there's no, I want it as smooth as I can get it. is what this metal rib is so good for. Alright. And there, we have one donut ready to go. So it looks good on that side and this side. My uh, pieces that I threw for the urn are not drying out. They are all sitting over there. Just waiting to stiffen up so that I can work with them. Um, we had a weather system move in. All that snow I'm wanting is going to be showing up. 
So that's exciting. But in the meantime, I need this to stiffen up and I don't really want to get a heat gun out, uh, mainly because I just need it right at that perfect, perfect, um, since there's so many pieces that need to be um, put together, it just needs to be perfect. And I don't, with the heat gun, I don't want to get it too dry on one spot or the other. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to go ahead and um, sculpt, get the tree ready, okay? So I do have this uh, wooden mat. We used it on the fairies. It's um, by Mako. So I did go ahead and roll that into a slab. Um, what I, the way I'm doing this, I end up pretty much rolling a lot of that texture out. But um, I'll show you how I make a, tr a tree trunk. So basically I've got the slab, I've got it cut, I also have a dowel, and so I plan to roll, you know, score and slip this and then roll it around the dowel for the main trunk. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm just going to score and slip this. You can also use that too. And then encourage the clay to do what I want it to do. I'm going to cut this down a little bit. When you're sculpting, it's literally every little bit you're adjusting as you go. Every little, every little bit of it. So, so I'm going to join those together around this dowel. And uh, this dowel, I I don't care that it's um it doesn't not need to be perfectly cylindrical. It's a tree trunk, you know. So the nice thing about the dowel is now I can actually really press that that um, seam there, okay? Because I can't really get in to smooth it on the inside. So this will allow me to make sure that that joint is really compressed because we definitely don't want that to open up. Okay, so I'm just going to draw that. And I will sometimes go in there for what I can reach on the ends that I can reach and smooth those. But by rolling it into the table, it's actually done a pretty good job. So now with the trunk of the tree, a lot of times I will actually just come in and do an irregular cut because I don't want it to be um, a straight cut. I mean, there are aren't trees that have straight cuts and then I'm going to push the trunk out and if it splits don't worry about it um, doing something like this I plan to add all the roots and that kind of thing so this is just to get this trunk started and then um, it's going to morph even more as I sculpt it and I'll do most of the sculpting um, when it's actually on the donut. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a little band-aid down there, smooth that in, just to give myself a little extra clay where that split. Okay. And I like the trunk, you know, it needs to be twisted and gnarled and so it gives you a lot of freedom to do stuff like this. And then I do most of this when it's um, already attached and I'll do more. I'll bring this tool in and just random give it.
Thank you.